Welcome to the next episode of the Foss North podcast. Um, just before we get going, I'd, I'd just like to mention that the call for papers for Foss North 2021 runs out on Sunday. So, so if you feel inspired, you have two more days to, to join the fun. Um, and with further no further ado, let's, let's go back to the podcast and uh, Cornelius Schumacher, please tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, hey, thanks for, for inviting me. Um, telling about myself, um, I think most most people know me from my uh, open source work um, in the KDE community um, and others. So I'm uh, involved there for for I think more than two decades now. Uh, I started out when when I was still uh, working in physics at the university, and there I got to know KDE from some colleagues, which were excited, and this dragged me into the project. And yeah, I never left after <laughs> that. So <laughs> that was how my open source career started. And uh, when I left the university, I joined uh, my first Linux distribution, uh, Caldera, uh, back then, um, a long time ago, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, my, yeah, I think the longest time I worked for SUSE Linux, um, that's that's where I did uh, yeah, a lot of work in different areas, but also still uh, having KDE work and other open source work on the side. And nowadays I'm uh, working at Deutsche Bahn, the uh, German railway company. So I'm at uh, DB Systel there. My role there is uh, called uh, the open source steward. So I'm responsible for the open source framework there. It's open source software and also contribute to open source. That's cool. Yeah, and the, the reason for, for pulling your hair is to discuss a bit about Qt licensing. Uh, but primarily the KDE Free Qt Foundation and sort of the setup around it, because it's it's a bit interesting to me. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, Qt is dual licensed, uh, and then then we have the Free Qt Foundation to sort of def make the obligations in the other direction if, to simplify things. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting setup. Um, I think it's it's really interesting because um, it's it's also a very old setup. So if you think about uh, the dual licensing model of Qt, uh, th that was when, when Qt started to do that, it was one of the first dual licensing model with the, uh, combining an open source license with a proprietary license. So nobody had experience with that back then. And um, uh, yeah, the, the founders of Trolltech, they uh, back then when they started uh, Qt, um, they had this idea in, in mind that they want to support the free software open source communities. Well, back then the term open source wasn't around yet. <laughs> so it was really in the ancient times. Uh, but uh, the thing was that they had this, this idea in mind that they wanted to support the, the free software communities. Uh, but of course, also they needed to think about how to run their business and how to um, earn the money to fund the development of Qt. And um, uh, yeah, a lot of things back then are now taken for given. Um, so I think we we know how to operate this, but back then it was experimentation um, to, to some degree. And um, the the I think the the great success um, uh, at the beginning was that this model of making Qt available for free software uh, worked out very well because KDE was founded and um, picked Qt up and used it and um, did a lot of work with that and attracted a lot of people. Um, a lot of people working on KDE software using Qt, so Qt users, developers using Qt. And uh, Trolltech back then was, was a small company. They just had a, a, a handful of developers or something like that. And the KDE community was already attracting hundreds. Um, so I think this, this model was um, really yeah, successful. And then the interesting thing, um, what also happened there, that um, the license of Qt back then was not open source. And um, it was um, a, a homegrown license uh, to the best of the knowledge of uh, the people who did that. Uh, but uh, it wasn't accepted by everybody. And I mean, those people who, are, who have been around at that time uh, still remember that there was a, really a controversy around uh, the Qt license. And the KDE project also got a lot of pushback from people who said, okay, you are, you are using a non-free license and um, it, uh, you something. And um, that, that was in the, in the setup there. And from, from this point of view, I think um, the, the idea to do something about that 
um, then resulted in this agreement, uh, this community contract, as I call it, with uh, the KDE Free Qt Foundation. Uh, but the idea was to, um, yeah, make make some guarantees to make sure that the freedom of Qt would be preserved for the community, that the community could, um, yeah, rely on Qt being available also in the long term. Um, I, so I sometimes um, refer to it as the license because the license is there to, to allow to use it and so on. And later, Qt was released under an open source license, so um, um, even put under the GPL at some point. So then, in, in principle, the, the problem of the uh, yeah, lacking freedom of the license was, uh, was, was solved. Uh, but um, the license only gives you the rights to the code you already have. And it doesn't say anything about what, what to do with that in the future. And, and that's where the agreement comes in, um, where it gives additional guarantees, uh, which go in the future so that um, the community can be sure that KDE can use Qt um, um, as free software um, also in the future. And the company has this obligation to keep it free and um, maintain it and release it. And if not, then the agreement uh, triggers and the community gets the right to release it under a permissive license, under the BSD license. Um, so this would then allow to yeah, create business models around that, which are similar to Qt and something like that. So from this point of view, the KDE Free Qt Foundation really is, an, I think, an innovation. Uh, it was uh, relatively simple at the beginning. Um, I think the, the negotiations and the thinking about that was uh, probably quite complex, but the result was just a three-page document, so um, quite simple. Um, over time, it has evolved and has become more complicated and more complex uh, because then all the different parts were also uh, looked at what uh, what parts of Q to consider and uh, the, how to define things properly, what is Q and what not. And uh, the, these things then added additional complexity. So I think it, I, I'm not aware of, of uh, uh, yeah, the same kind of agreement in other projects. So I think it's a pretty unique thing. Um, and yeah, one of the questions is, um, is that a good thing or is some, uh, some projects missing out on this opportunity to do more than just the licensing? I mean, we, we see a lot of, uh, fights also about licensing and about uh, yeah, why should I contribute to a project which is owned by a company? And uh, you have to find answers to that. And the KD Free Good Foundation agreement is, I think, one one of the answers which is out there, which um, allows that and uh, gives a motivation to do it. To, to um, me, it's it's even a, a guarantee towards the customers because I, I think it the 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 agreement triggers also if the Qt company would go bankrupt. Which means that then you get the product as as BSD and can sort of continue developing it, hopefully jointly in the open. But you, even proprietary customers, can sort of continue with it. Yeah, exactly. I think th this is uh, you always have this risk with uh, these single vendor projects where a vendor is controlling the complete project and has the, uh, all the rights to release it, and nobody else has the same um, level of rights. And uh, this this obviously is a risk for everybody, not only for a community, but also for any company using it. And um, the KD Free Qt Foundation agreement is is a way to yeah, address this risk in in some way. I'm a bit curious when you wrote the first contracts uh, of this kind, uh, were there lawyers involved? There were lawyers involved. Um, it, it, uh, it was actually fun to do the research for the presentation I did at Fostem about um, the KD Free Qt Foundation because there I talked to a lot of people. I, I wasn't around at that time. So I, I joined KDE shortly after, um, uh, yeah, around before the KDE 2 release and uh, the, the work with the KDE Free Qt Foundation, all that happened around the KDE 1 release. So that's mostly uh, before my time. Um, but then I talked talk to the people who were involved, tried to find them. Uh, it wasn't that easy, but <laughs> I had some interesting conversations uh, also with uh, uh, Eric, one of the founders of Trolltech, who uh, shared some uh, interesting thoughts and uh, historical emails with me. That, that was really insightful. And uh, one, one thing he said is that um, the, the pivotal point um, for the agreement was the first KDE developer meeting in, in Germany in 1996, I guess. And at that time, um, 
yeah, the Trotec people, they came to Germany, joined the uh, KDE people for, for the meeting. They discussed technology, of course, but also had, had these discussions. And there the proposal was uh, brought forward. And um, they, they had the dis discussions about that, how to do that. They also had an idea what uh, how, how this should be. Uh, but then um, Trotec wanted to do it properly. And um, they hired actually a prestigious uh, lawyer to finalize, finalize this. Um, it was fun to hear the story about um, uh, how hard it is to convince a lawyer to write such an agreement where you give up <laughs> some of the things you own <laughs> forever <laughs> without any way to <laughs> get them back. Uh, but um, in the end, they found this construction. And uh, uh, yeah, I think from a legal point of view, it's, it's a very sound uh, construction. Has, has it changed a lot over time? I mean, Qt's licensing has changed. So, so I mean, then that's the background of my question. I mean, first you had the QPL, and then I guess it moved gradually over to GPL2, I would assume, or two or later, with the, starting with X11, and then I think OS X came when there was, when OS X came with X11 support, the, the Mac branch was released, and then finally the Windows support. And then with Nokia times, it moved to LGPL to many of the modules, but not all. I think tools were still GPL, if I recall correctly. Um, and now we're sort of seeing the introduction of, of various GPL v3 uh, and LGPL v3 versions for, for uh, modules as we transition from 5 to 6 or from 5.6 to 5.7. I think there was an update as well. Yeah. Um... There are tons of details there, and and I think that this is what what mostly changed in the agreement. So the fundamental construction um, with with the licensing um, um, that's still there, uh, but all the details have changed, of course. So uh, the the cute modules, the, the how, how the cute release is called, what is included, the licenses, of course, that's an important part. Um, uh, and in the in the text, what what mostly has changed is trying to define things in a in a clearer way way and adapt them to to what is happening so and this actually has uh, grown the agreement by i don't know a factor of uh, three or, or four or something in size um, so if you read the agreement now it's very detailed and contains definitions for everything and and so on um, i think one one really interesting aspect is that the um, the the agreement from from the beginning uh, it's a very simple one, um, uh, but the, the effect it had was not only that this guarantee would be in place for the case things go wrong, uh, but it also has led to this constant um, conversation between the KDE community and the Qt company um, because, uh, yeah, there is a provision to have regular meetings and so on um, in, in the KDE Free Qt Foundation. And um, all the license changes uh, were things which were discussed in advance with the KDE community. So KDE always had a table there at the, in the negotiations uh, about future licenses and so on. And um, th this, I think, is a very healthy thing uh, because it also creates this feedback channel for a company to yeah, not change things unilaterally and then things are ba bad or, the, or badly constructed or they miss things or they, they are, you know, worked against their own users or own customers. Uh, but in this, this case, I think this ongoing conversation is a very healthy thing um, and helped, I think, also to, to shape uh, the right balance there between community interests and company interests. So, uh, and in in the in the end, I think is one of the critical factors for the success of Qt in the long term. Yeah. So, if, if I simplify as much as I possibly can, uh, the 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 contract is uh, there's a trigger and then there is some kind of action. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, what? Uh, can you describe the trigger? What, what so like what triggers the action to happen? So the the, the trigger um, is when Qt isn't released, um, or the or more precisely the the free edition of Qt. Uh, so the edition which KDE uses is not released um, anymore and not maintained by by the company anymore. And it's defined what that means in in the in the contract. Um, and there's a yeah, a period uh, uh, the community has to wait. So that's that's twelve months. So when when the the company owning Qt fails to release an 
a significant update um, of Qt of the free edition for for uh, uh, more than 12 months, then um, the trigger um, uh, becomes active, and then the foundation um, can decide. So the KDE Free Qt Foundation. Um, so that, that's uh, actually one thing you also have to understand that there are third parties involved. There. There's the company, there's the KDE community, and there's a third organization, the KDE Free, Free Qt Foundation, with the only purpose of holding the rights uh, um, on the agreement and being the contract partner there. So that's one indirection to make it safer against uh, uh, yeah, requests in terms of bankruptcy and so on. Um, and uh, then the KD Free Qt Foundation, which uh, consists of representatives of um, the Qt company and the KD community, um, can um, do this release under the BSD license. And the KD community for, for these uh, cases has the majority in the board of the KD Free Qt Foundation. So effectively, the community can decide against uh, uh, the, the will of the company if they um, fail to um, release these uh, significant updates. So that's that's the exact construction there. And this is has been there from the beginning, and um, that's exactly the same today. So only what means KDE, uh, what means Qt uh, free edition, um, and uh, what are the licenses and so on? All these things they they have been refined. Um, so for example, the platforms have have been included over time. So at the beginning it was just uh, X Windows and uh, Windows was not uh, so Microsoft Windows was not included in the contract, and this has been added uh, much much later actually. Yeah, I'm trying to recall. There was modularization with Qt 3, wasn't there? So, so that must have affected it. And then that was taken further in Qt 4 and Qt 5. And there's been various instances of, of like commercial modules. I'm trying to come up with one. When Qt Charts, for instance, I think has always been commercial. So I guess that's outside of the contract and an add-on that the Qt company sells as a commercial only thing. Yeah, um, and that also always was one of the fears, um, which was there that um, there would be kind of a loophole which would allow um, to move things out of Qt itself to other products, call it differently, um, and in this sense make make um, the Qt framework um, less valuable or remove essential components. And um, of course, I mean it's it's a real problem, and then the lawyers come into play and <laughs> have to define how. What, what that actually means and how to prevent that. And there's language in the contract which tries to achieve that. Uh, one of the reasons for, for having you on right now is that there's been some controversy around Qt 6, as I understand it. But perhaps I can summarize it in, in my words and you can, you can correct me. But my, my understanding is that the, the, the trigger only applies to uh, to the current latest branch, so to speak. That's what needs to be maintained in the open. And and that Qt 6 then was released and took over. But Qt 6.0 is, is sort of not feature complete. It does not contain all the modules. Then, then we're targeting Qt 6.2 or something. So during that transition time, the contract sort of fails because the, the interesting branch is the latest five dot something, but the contract points to the six dot something. Is, is that a good picture of the of the controversies from the past months? Yeah, um, I, I mean the the scope of the uh, discussions which have been happening over the last couple of months is, is bigger than just uh, what is covered by the uh, agreement because the agreement really is uh, uh, pretty focused on the availability um, and not so much about the details. Uh, and that's why there, there's no, no branching structure defined or a number of stable branches or duration you have to maintain. It's, it's, uh, it's a general availability and this can be fulfilled by having one version which uh, provides everything. Um, and the same with the open source licenses. Uh, I mean, you can release code under the GPL, but that doesn't um, enforce you to do a specific development model, model or to uh, maintain uh, your software in a specific way. And um, of course, there are expectations uh, in, in the, the whole setup where you want some guarantees or you want some, some uh, services or you want to have some collaboration in, in a specific way. So how, how we do things in the open source community. And uh, th this, I think, is a, is, uh, 
always the the balance between business and community as a company of course you have to ask yourself the question how how do i get my money <laughs> and that's the purpose of a company um, for the community of course this isn't a question so you have to balance that and um, there are different approaches to that and i think over time obviously this has changed um, uh, the, the company was uh, bought uh, several times uh, went through different stages of uh, also commercial success and uh, obviously the uh, the drivers and the motivation also the market around has changed obviously over the last 20 years um, so from this point of view i think the uh, the current setup is um, um, Yeah, you, you have to understand, I think, the whole scope to, to make sense of what is happening there. From the agreement, I would say, um, I think always, and that has always been the case, is that the cute company was willing to fulfill it and, and uh, was respectful to the community, um, depending on, on the face and the company and the people, sometimes uh, more, sometimes less. But I think there always was a big uh, awareness of the contract and um, that this is an, an important success factor also for Qt. Um, and um, now we see that uh, yeah, the commercial direction of Qt has changed, um, I would say, quite a bit. Um, the, the model is a bit different there. Um, The company does, I would say, less for the community than than before. So you see that with the uh, uh, yeah, maintenance branches and so on. Um, and uh, this, of course, creates these questions: how how do we deal with that? And in KDE, we have, especially with the Q6, um, uh, um, yeah, the, the going uh, yeah, porting KDE to <laughs> to Q6 um, with uh, with this transition, KDE has, uh, of course, a huge effort there. I, uh, I recently actually looked up a block entry award uh, many years ago for Q. Cute KDE, I don't know, four or five or something, where, where I tried to extrapolate how, how long it would take us <laughs> to, <laughs> to do the transition. And I think I underestimated, underestimated by a year or something like that, just because KDE is a lot of code and uh, not enough people who enjoy these uh, porting efforts. <laughs> so from, from this, of course, there's a problem, I, I, I think, um, where yeah, the community... It, it's, I think it's all still in the legal rights of what the Qt company um, can do according to the contract, also to the license and so on. And it's, uh, I think, fair for them to decide what is best for, for their business. Um, but then, of course, somehow the community has to cope with that or also try to influence that where, where it's possible because I think some, some of the decisions the Qt company has taken in the past uh, probably were not only not in the interest of the community, but also not in the interest of um, customers and um, also not in, in their own interest, I would say. I mean, the world has changed. It's, it's, when, when I initially... It must be 13, 14 years ago where I had a small stint at, at the Oslo office and, and we did training material. And then the pitch was really that Qt is a cross desktop platform thingy uh, and, and the portability was key. And then I guess the I've always sort of looked at it as, as it was a direction change during Nokia towards devices. Yeah. But also, if you look at the world today, the focus isn't desktop anymore. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> saying that to KDE guy might, might be hurtful. <laughs> Sorry, no offense intended. But I mean, it, it's turned into devices, and, and that changes the business model somewhat into into license fees per device rather than license fees per developer, and and finding a balance there. So, yeah, I hope this was the year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living in this perpetual year of the Linux desktop, so I really enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a Pine phone, so now I have the year of the Linux phone instead. I've given up on the desktop. <laughs> you can put it on your desktop. Uh, so we're, we're talking about from Qt down to uh, KDE, but I'm interested in how much code flows from KDE back to Qt. Oh, um, I, you get the question, I hope. Yeah. Um, and how is that regulated with copyright assignments, et cetera? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, because this also illust illustrates one, one of the uh, problems which was there at the beginning. Uh, uh, because um, at the beginning, um, when Qt started, um, uh, this was not possible. So Qt would not accept patches from the outside. Mm -hmm. 
um, because of copyright reasons or because they wanted to own everything and they wanted to have full control and they ran the CI and everything. So there was no open governance model. Um, and th this was only later introduced, um, um, yeah, I think, during Nokia times mostly. Um, so it took a, took a while to introduce that, which made it possible um, to contribute at all. And um, so at the beginning, um, especially at the very beginning, when um, you know, Qt also was not as mature and um, KDE was um, also doing a lot of development um, around yeah, the libraries, there was more like this informal thing that um, yeah, people would just talk to each other and then the Qt engineer would, would write the patch which is necessary or um, somehow they, they would transfer that or they would hire a KDE person. And <laughs> I mean, that happened <laughs> quite a a couple of times so and with, with the open governance model this changed um, so this made it possible to contribute um, to Qt in a um, regular way uh, but the uh, um, the uh, yeah the copyright still uh, or the rights um, of the copyright which allow Qt to also sell a proprietary version what what's the dual business the dual license business model um, this uh, requires uh, this contributor license agreement so you have to sign that when when you contribute to Qt uh, but then it's possible and uh, CLAs um, are uh, yeah controversial as well <laughs> um, some companies like them some companies feel that they are necessary um, for s such a case as uh, dual licensing and selling a proprietary version you need them that it, it is necessary but it's of course an imbalance uh, because that's rights the company has and the, uh, the contributor doesn't have and the kd free Qt foundation counters um, this imbalance in some way so i think that's that's the way how to how to also put it that um, if i contribute to Qt um, then um, I give the Qt company uh, more rights than, than um, I have um, on Qt. Um, and that's fine uh, because that sustains the business. And that's also fine because I have the guarantee by the KDE Free Qt Foundation that um, the company will not just take the stuff and run away. Uh, but if they do that, I get uh, my code back in some way and can, can run a business model on that. And with the open the introduction of open governance, um, it changed uh, completely how KDE contributed to Qt. I mean, before they contributed by people <laughs> in some way, and and um, uh, after it was possible, there was a massive effort to um, yeah, port back changes we did in KDE or additional wrappers, libraries, classes, extensions of classes, and so on, to put them back into Qt. Um, so for some time, we, we operated under the vision to uh, merge KDE back into Qt um, or merge the KDE libraries back into Qt. And this succeeded, I think, to, uh, to some degree. I mean, there's still uh, KDE frameworks around, and uh, we use them. And there's, of course, code which doesn't fit into, into Qt, but this has changed a lot. Um, I think nowadays it's uh, less because there's less less work, and also I think the the focus of the KDE community has has shifted a bit um, because it's much more distributed now, much more focused on applications, um, individual applications. They all have their own communities. It's not the one big KDE community anymore, which creates this unified desktop um, and everybody works on everything. Um, so nowadays, I think the also the motivation to contribute to Qt probably is a bit bit lower in the KDE community, but that also might be just my view. Um, I'm, I know that there are still people contributing <laughs> and enjoy that and uh, uh, benefit from that. I mean, it seems to be a lot of uh, collaboration around the desktop standards and things like that. And I, I'm thinking about Wayland and driver support and how to, I mean, it, it's quite interesting that Kwin, for instance, is a, is a separate Wayland compositor than the Qt Wayland one. And, and as I understand, there are there is knowledge shared definitely between the two different Qt-based implementations of a Wayland compositor then, for instance. Yeah. But then you have the KD frameworks, which I think is is a is a real gem that people often miss. I mean, you <laughs> it, it's not on the front page of KD, so to speak, but there's lots of handy things in there. It's uh, yeah, having it, K archive to handle zip files saved me hours of work instead of having to wrap something manually in C. Right. 
Yeah, I think uh, all, all these things are born from from practice. Um, I mean, KD created that over now more than two decades uh, to create the things which were missing in Qt. So we had to write them ourselves. And uh, so there's sometimes you see that that some things maybe are uh, too practical, so they don't have the greatest APIs or some something. Uh, that, that's that's on the other hand a big strength of Qt that they, they, they have this really really good API design and and they implement things properly and provide the interfaces in a way which are really intuitive and good. But um, the the practical parts of then actually the taking these APIs and making applications from it uh, that's something which uh, KDE of course did, did a lot. And yeah. you're right. There, there are lots of gems in the in the KD frameworks. Um, there are also some things where you would say, okay, that's maybe a little bit more historical, and <laughs> you can see uh, maybe you don't need that anymore. But uh, then on the other hand, you also have these uh, new things which come from, for example, the the development which happens on phones or, or other mobile devices, and which brings in new technology. Um, so that there also still is innovation there. So. I, I really like that. I mean, the frameworks are a huge thing, and they are certainly understuffed. Um, we don't have enough developers to uh, to really maintain them. Um, uh, but that also, on the other hand, is, is an advantage in that they are stable, and um, they are not changing in a radical way. So you can rely on them and just use them, and they will work. I'm, uh, I can't leave the, <laughs> the, like, the thoughts about who is contributing to who. So. Who's contributing to uh, KDE the most? Is it companies? Is it uh, like uh, private developers or? Um, I think KDE always has been volunteer driven. So it was mostly volunteers, uh, which were not so professionals. So people working for companies, professional software developers. I mean, I think that's that's a common scenario in open source that, that you have people who know what they do. Um, so it's not amateurs, but they're not paid by a company to do the exact work they, they do. And this um, has been the model in, in KDE, I think, from, from the beginning. And um, it hasn't changed uh, much. Of course, we, we also always had company contributions um, when projects happened with um, around KDE software, so we had some of of the um, yeah more famous and uh, bigger projects, like for example, what in Germany the the, the BSI um, did uh, the the agency for uh, information security. They they um, developed uh, group uh, or invested quite quite a bit of effort into the group part of KDE. So contact email and so on uh, to also support that to other platforms and um, make it available on Windows and Mac. And uh, um, so so this is. One example where we had quite a bit of uh, paid project work going into KDE, um, and then of course we we always also had people who were employed by um, companies who uh, yeah gave people the freedom to to work on KDE. So uh, in some cases, for example, the Linux distributions. I mean that also has changed a bit. So um, at the time when <laughs> people were still chasing the year of the Linux desktop and. <laughs> Uh, it was really um, a big uh, argument for selling the new version of a, of a Linux distribution to have the latest version of KDE on it. Um, then the distributions also employed uh, more people to just work on KDE. So, for example, SUSE in Germany, I mean, they they had a, a, a yeah a team of of several core KDE contributors to to work on KDE and to advance that because it was critical for their business at that time. So this has changed uh, now. Of course, things distributions are uh, usually not not very desktop centric anymore. Uh, uh, the desktop centric distributions are probably also more volunteer driven. Um, so there, uh, I think, is, is less involvement. But then on the other hand, you have other other projects with, which are happening and uh, um, also investment going into that. Yeah. Do you have these contribution graphs for KDE? I, I know, wasn't it Tiago who started maintaining them for Qt? Basically, looking at the domain of the emails. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we had a time at KDE when uh, we had some people working on on these graphs and these statistics. I don't know if that is still happening in this. Uh, I, I don't, those people, I think, um, are not doing it anymore. Uh, it also has become much more difficult um, with uh, our move to Git, uh, when uh, all the KDE code, code was in one big subversion repository, then statistic uh, were easier. Nowadays, you have to track all the Git repositories and understand how they relate and what is activity and whatnot. 
Um, so it's it's harder, I think. Uh, there certainly are statistic, but, uh, statistics, but at the moment, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know any numbers or anything. <laughs> Do you know, by any chance, how many active developers you have in Kitty? I, I don't have a proper definition of what I mean with active, but... Yeah, um, I think what what we usually say is um, a couple of hundred. Um, so I, I think we have probably uh, thousands of developer accounts. Not all of them are active, uh, but it's uh, it's also very distributed, and um, it depends, of course, also how you count. I mean, we have, for example, many translators who who are active and do great work, um, but they are usually not writing code and they are working in a bit different way. So sometimes it's also not as visible what they are doing and compared to developers. And then, of course, you have the uh, yeah the, the core stuff on the on the frameworks and, and the core KDE applications. But uh, you also have uh, pretty much independent communities like like for example Krita, which which uh, have has their own organization uh, even and uh, which operates as part of KDE, but uh, has yeah a lot of things which which are managed by by uh, the, the project in in a specific way. So it's. I'm always surprised how many people know KDE. Uh, uh, being a long-term KDE contributor is great because you always meet these people who say, "Oh yeah, I used KDE back then in 1998, and it was great." <laughs> 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 and uh, so uh, I think the impact of KDE has has been uh, quite quite big. Uh, also beyond just the people who were developing it or even who were using it, uh, because it was one one of the biggest uh, open source projects. Uh, um, yeah, in the in the time when 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 it started, it became really big. Um, and nowadays, of course, we have tons of huge open source projects, and we have this uh, massive projects like Kubernetes and all the cloud native stuff and uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, there are so many open source projects around that it's really hard to hard to keep track, and uh, it's also hard to manage <laughs> that. So KDE has a different challenge there, I think. Uh, but what also I I always like about KDE that that it really has been very stable. So there always was activity. There never was a time when uh, we had to fear the project would die. And uh, part of that is community. Part of that is culture. Part of this, uh, the, the people. Um, also, the uh, taking in new generations. Um, another part of that, of course, is also the stability of the organization and um, also the stability of the uh, legal framework with the licenses and uh, with with the KDF um, Foundation agreement. So I think it's it's a very healthy combination of factors which um, allows a lot of people to be active there and also always new people to find find a home in at KDE. So we have accepted a couple of applications um, in KDE over time, which came from a complete other direction. Now, not everything started in KDE, but we have this kind of incubation program for for many years now, where we, um, yeah, give applications or communities or teams who um, need that or who can benefit from from a bigger platform and and um, stable organization behind that we give them the opportunity to join us and uh, if the values align and the technology is not conflicting then this is um, usually a, a win-win situation but uh, a side note i st i think it was 98 99 perhaps i started to use kitty on a old solaris <laughs> <laughs> do you know if there's any project out there open source of free software that has a similar setup uh, as kitty has with qt um yeah, as I said, I, I don't think there's any any project which has the same kind of agreement in this this community contract um, term. Um, of course, there there are, there are lots of projects now where you have 
uh, company driving a product as uh, open core or something, and then the, you have a commu community. Uh, usually, I would say the community is more dependent on on the company or more more built by the company. So if you look at the the big uh, um, yeah single vendor projects, uh, which uh, yeah in some cases I even have have moved away from being open source, like, like I don't know MongoDB or Elasticsearch and so on. These these projects, um, which which are huge um, single vendor projects so there there you you see similar things but that's more i think corporate driven um kde never was uh yeah always was i think on on eye level with with the company so it was never this um uh, the, the company builds a community to support their, their product um but then of course i think You, you certainly can find examples where you also have um, independent organizations and independent um, companies. I mean, in some time, sometimes founders of projects uh, uh, found a company and then leave the company again and uh, still still run the project and, and so on. Uh, but, it, but it's hard to compare because it's really in the details then. Um, But I think that this really this formal act of balancing uh, this uh, yeah the, the interests uh, in the community with legal means by a contract, um, I think that's actually pretty unique. Um, Circling back a bit on that topic, because I, I think we missed one part when we discussed it uh, first time around. But what's the current status, so to speak? So so Q6 is covered by the. Uh, By the contract and then is sort of uh, made available by the cute company and and then i th as i understand it kde maintains let's call it convenience branch which corresponds to the lts branch that the cute company provides uh based yeah. on, on sort of merging patches and make it available to the community then Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is one of the decisions the cute company has taken that they only offer the long term um, support for older branches uh, to paying customers. Um, so this is not available in the same way for for the community anymore. Um, and yeah, as, as we discussed before, uh, moving between major versions is a huge effort. Um, so obviously KDE needs um, a stable base for for that um, until everything is available in Qt6 and and all the porting work has has been done. Um, and and for for that KDE now maintains a, a, yeah, a collection of patches basically which which are required and uh, which. Yeah, fix critical issues and so on. The policy there is that um, it, it should only be patches which already are in Qt6 um, or in the in the development branch, um, so that it's uh, it's not a fork, it's not not a different version. The idea is to keep uh, keep that as close uh, to Qt as possible, so it's not not an independent effort. Um, I would also hope that the collaboration there is happening in the same way as it ha happened in the past, that the Qt engineers are working with, with the community people to make sure that patches are working and stuff is available and critical issues are fixed and so on. Um, but um, it's um, yeah, the availability of the code um, uh, now is in, in form of this patch collection um, for, for Qt. And this is also, it's interesting, it reminds me of the good old days because uh, KDE always was maintaining something like that. Um, or not always, actually, but but for a very long time, uh, as, as I said, and... ex exactly, this uh, <laughs> cute copy module. Um, so uh, as, as we said before, it, it wasn't possible to contribute to Qt before. So KDE had to do that. And um, Qt copy always was more convenient thing for building the software. So having having um, an easier checkout. And um, then after some, and it, it I looked it up actually. It was around uh, almost from the beginning, um, so so it really is a very very old thing to have this cute copy. And at some point, uh, people started to also patch things. So um, sometimes uh, have um, yeah pre-release patches, um, something like that, or stuff which was still in development, or in some cases also um, KDE used that to move to a, um, a newer Qt version. So um, using a, a, a better version or something like that as Qt copy to have a stable and common base uh, for everybody to work on, or at least an agreement on, on what is the expected state of Qt uh, we are developing against. And uh, today, I think it's uh, less focus on these, uh, uh, yeah, going to to newer versions, uh, but more like we need the stability um, and we need the availability of the old version um, still around. 
So we maintain that, and um, I think the KDE community is a natural place for that because um, we, uh, we, in some way, also through the agreement uh, with the KDE Free Qt Foundation, we are a steward uh, for for uh, the you know, community part of Qt uh, in in some way, and um, so by collecting these patches in in one location so that KDE can use it, but also that um, uh, distributions can ship it, for example. Um, that's, uh, I think, a good move, which um, hopefully uh, yeah, also removes some of the, the redundant work, which uh, otherwise would have been done. So it would make sense if every Linux distribution does the same patches uh, just for themselves. Um, so we, we still have to see how, how this develops over a longer time. So it has been announced. It's it's around now. KDE is using it. Um, so I think so, some questions are still open there. Uh, but I think the general approach is quite pra pragmatic um, um, in, in the end. Um, yeah, we, we have to see how 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 the success of that that will be. I mean, we all hope that uh, the cute company is uh, successful from a business point of view. That's that's the foundation we all rely on. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, also we we need uh, something from the company to be able to uh, do the community work. And um, I think there's a mutual benefit, which which, which is uh, there where openness uh, I th I think is advantageous, and uh, it's it's good for the company to um, yeah make sure the community can actually uh, work in a way which is uh, yeah good for for both sides and which doesn't put hurdles in in the way um, i, I al i'm always a fan of aligning the interests uh, um, there so that the community interests are uh, not opposing the company interests and the other way around because in the end uh, the success is just bigger if if you work together in the same direction and not try to fight your customers or fight your users in in some way by trying to uh, yeah get get more business. Uh, the long term strategy certainly is uh, adoption through the community um, and monetizing the needs of uh, then customers who who need more than uh, just an open source version. Yeah, and it's impressive to, I mean, looking back at it, just keeping it together across, I mean, the, the industry has changed or the focus of, of of where Qt is used as a technology, but also, I mean, you've had, what is it, four owners on the on the Qt side, uh, if, if you consider Digi and, and Troll Tech, or the Qt company separate entities. Yeah. If, if you start counting names for the Qt company during uh, Nokia days, I guess we're approaching 10 or something. <laughs> cute software, cute development frameworks. <laughs> oh yeah, well. yeah. But it's a it's an old hairy beast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But we're, we're slowly running out of time, so so perhaps we should uh, pause there for a bit, uh, and uh, we will see when we talk next time. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a pleasure. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting topic, interesting people, interesting community. So I always enjoy uh, discussing these uh, <laughs> these questions, <laughs> and also to I, I somehow see it in my role to also uh, yeah remember the history and uh, sometimes uh, bring some of the things which uh, I learned over time and the community learned over time, which uh, the people who join the community. Uh, now, uh, of course, are not have not experienced themselves to keep some of the lessons learned learned alive. So that's always a good thing to talk about this stuff and also the current situation, of course. So thank you for having me. It was fun. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. <laughs> uh, we will link, uh, uh, by the way, your talk uh, you did at Foster. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's so great. there will be links in the in the description if you watch it as a video or in the in the links collection for the episode if you watch it or listen to it as a pod. Uh, definitely. And don't forget Call for Papers on Sunday. Uh, yeah. Thank so you for being here. Thank you.